do like the energy and the enthusiasm. I'm just jealous, really. <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> oh, oh, did you want to give us an update on Joe and your mom? Let's see. Um, okay, I want to make sure that we have time today. Uh, it was funny that Doc mentioned um, that we were uh, in the, the period of the, the resurrection. And I was thinking, well, no, we're coming up on Easter, so we're that, that's not right. And then I was thinking, well, but we are in the time period of the resurrection, so okay. A and the reason that caught me off guard was because today's message is actually about the ascension, which is out of order because we're coming up on Easter. So I'm kind of skipping ahead to Ascension Sunday, but there's a, a method to the madness. I want to talk about what that means for us today and some of the layers of, of meaning and some of the, the cultural um, ideas behind Jesus' ascension to heaven and uh, how sometimes we, we kind of gloss over that. And it's just like, well, yeah, he rose from the grave and he spent some time with the disciples and then he ascended to heaven. What's the big deal? Well, the more you ask those questions and you start to get specific, what does that even mean? And why did he ascend? And then, you know, more specifically, where did he go? So, uh, you know, and if he did go, then why did he leave us here? And what does it mean that we're stuck here? So um, it, it reminded me, too, of when I was a teenager, I was asking my mom where God was. And, you know, it wasn't just that kind of silly little question that, you know, like a, maybe a, a toddler would ask or something, but it was a, you know, a teenager probing for a location. And, and uh, <laughs> we had just joined a different church at the time, and I figured, well, you know, th apparently this church seems to know everything, and by extension, Mom will know everything. So, you know, Mom, where is God? And I, I don't know where she got it from, and I'm sure she doesn't even remember saying this, and she would laugh at it now, but she said something like, I think he's in the northern skies somewhere. And, you know, even as a teenager, just becoming aware of astronomy, it's like, well, I don't understand that. Why does, the, why does he get to be over the North Pole? What about the people in Australia? You know, do they just kind of get the short end of the stick? Are they, you know, it's like, well, God isn't above them. He's like, you got to go around the planet to get to God. And it was just like, I didn't quite understand. Why, what does that even mean that he's like up in the northern skies? It's like you draw a straight line from the Earth and you go up through the northern skies and then you get to the, the right star or something. And for that how do we even know that? Is there a verse that said God's up in the northern skies? And, and then, you know, later on, um, I learned a little bit more about theology, and I learned that Jesus became a human being, and even after his death and resurrection, continues to be a human being, took on humanity, <laughs> reappeared to the disciples and said, I'm not a ghost, look at my scars, give me some food to eat. So apparently he's a human being, and then he rose, and then where did he go? Is it like his body is just floating out in space past Jupiter, like waiting for his second coming or something? And, you know, inquiring minds want to know what is going on with Jesus. Is he still corporeal like we are? Does he still have a physical body? And if he is, what is he doing, and where did he go? So when you start to ask silly questions like that, then the ascension kind of brings on a whole other layer of meaning. So I want to talk about that today because it came up recently recently in this uh, class I'm taking, but I thought this was interesting. You know this John Lennon song, Imagine? I heard it in a restaurant yesterday, and I always, I, I hope I don't offend any Beatles fans, but I always hated this song. <laughs> and the first line is what always got me, imagine there's no heaven. And I was like, I don't even want to imagine that. Why would I want to imagine there's no perfect paradise? Why would I want to imagine that God doesn't exist? It sounds like he's inviting me to consider hell. 
And then, of course, well, he says, no hell below us. So you're completely discounting anything other than what's here. So it always just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And so then I started over time, you know, it, it gets played once in a while. So, you know, you, you hear it maybe in an elevator or in the car or wherever, and it's a nice tune. So even if you don't like the lyrics, it's kind of a lullaby, you know, and it just kind of, it'll soothe you, it'll calm you, it'll make you want to buy some more cupcakes in the bakery, you know, it's just like, in some way it will affect your psyche. And I started to listen to the words a little bit more, and I was thinking about, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, no hell below us, above us only sky, imagine all the people living for today. And it occurred to me that we as Christians, if we think of the resurrection and the ascension as something that happened, and then Jesus kind of leaves us behind to wait until he comes back, then I think that's kind of what Lenin is getting at is that what if people aren't constantly thinking about the next life? What if they were actually living for the world around us? And I'm not by any stretch making John Lennon a theologian. However, I think he does speak to a truth about Christian living today, about Christian ethics, about our behavior. I know far too many people who think that we are just in limbo now and we are just waiting for this world to end. I know a lot of missionary folks who are like that, and they're just saying, come Lord Jesus, because I am done with this planet. I don't think that's a biblical perspective, and I don't think that's what Jesus was doing. So I want to dive into that today. What does it mean to live for today from the perspective of Jesus, and what would he have us do? So some of the ideas and some of the quotes that I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm going to be reading from today are from this book, Simply Jesus, by N.T. Wright. Uh, he's quite a scholar, but he uh, brings some deep theological issues uh, down for the average poor person. Fortunately for me, he made it easier to digest, but some of what I'm quoting is going to come from here. Um, but let's start at the beginning here, Acts 1, 1 through 4, where it talks about Jesus' ascension. So let's just kind of read through this together. Uh, this is Luke writing, and he says, In my former book, now, he means his gospel, Luke's gospel. They sometimes call it Luke Acts because the same author, it's almost like volume one, volume two. Volume one is about the life of Jesus. Volume two is about what Jesus continues to do through the brand new church in Acts. So when he says, in my former book, he's talking about in what we would call the book of Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do. That's an easy one to gloss over. Jesus started things in his earthly ministry, and then they continued through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the church. So he says about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, I'm going to stop right there for a second. Remember with scripture, we're not necessarily going to take everything literally. It might have been a literal 40 days. It could have just been a complete time by God's definition. So 40 days can just mean like when he decided that was enough time, then he went. But either way, after 40 days uh, and spoke about the kingdom of God, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So Jesus here is speaking to the disciples and he says, wait, don't go out yet. There's something else. For John baptized with water, John the Baptist, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now remember, when Jesus started to institute a kingdom, it wasn't what the Jews expected a kingdom to be. And there's a long historical lineage there. We don't have time to go into it. But they're asking here again, and I feel like by this point, maybe they've got a better idea of your kingdom. But he's asking about the timing again. They're asking, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Well, it wasn't before you died, and now that you've died and you've come back, now? 
Jesus said to him, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Or in more vernacular terms, don't worry about the dates. That's not the point right now. It's not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send you a helper. I will be with you through this helper. The helper will point to me, and you will be my witnesses. Well, witness to what? Well, to who he is and everything that he did, and that there is good news to be heard. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from sight. Why that imagery? Why would Jesus rise up? And again, we are so permeated with our Western culture and our Western ideas of space and time and matter that we just we take this for granted. It's like, well, he went away. But then we know better than that. We know Jesus is here with us. So why did he go away? If he says, I'm with you always, what's up with this whole levitation act? What's up with the cloud? What is going on here? What's the significance of this whole leaving and being taken up in a cloud? What is all of that about? And why, do we, why does that even matter to us? Okay, four quick points about the ascension. If you look back to the way the Jews saw the world, heaven and earth were not far apart. As N.T. Wright likes to say, it's not like you need a spaceship to get between heaven and earth. Okay? Israel didn't see space, time, and matter like we do. The temple was the heart of everything. It was the holiest spot on earth, the center of the world. Now, most of us are familiar with throwing out the occult and throwing out magical things and magical places. Well, in ancient Israel, there was a place that was supernatural. That was the temple. That was the presence of God. There was a holy, sacred space. Today, we can almost kind of laugh at the idea of a sacred space because everything is symbolic and we live life in the spirit. But then there was this idea of the temple being the heart of everything. The temple has always been where heaven and earth meet. So think about that for a second. Heaven and earth kind of joining together and they meet at the temple. And we'll get back to this temple idea. It was the place where God himself had promised to come and live. And it was where his glory, his tabernacling presence, his Shekinah glory had come to rest. Now we remember that most of us are Old Testament scholars because of our history um, in this particular denomination. We remember the temple was a big deal. Well, in ancient Israel, the temple was the center of the universe. Okay, if you were to draw a map of the universe, it's like you've got the temple and then you've got everything else around it. So the center of the universe. You can kind of see it this way in terms of you've got these different realms and because of the temple, they intersect. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, because of the temple changing, there's going to be war. Jesus refers to himself as the temple. Remember when he cleanses the temple and he turns over the tables and uh, in John's account he makes a, a, a whip out of the cords and drives out everybody. He cleanses the temple and says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. Jesus now starts saying, I'm the temple. Well, if the temple is the center of the universe, Jesus is saying, hey, guess what? I am the center of the universe. Now, them's fighting words. It wasn't just that Jesus said, I'm the son of man or I'm the son of God. Other leaders had come by in history and said, I am the son of God. It's kind of like, okay, well, grab a number. There are people before you who claim that too. But he is saying, I am now the center of the universe. I am where heaven and earth meet. I am the Lord. I am God. So then we get into issues. The great scenes of confrontation and conflict in Acts all focus on the question of temples, 
both Jewish and pagan, and on the role and claim of the Christian community in relation to them. The temple is the center of the universe, and Jesus is saying, I am the temple, then everything is shifting. All of human history is shifting. The temple was the place, like the tabernacle in the wilderness, where God, from which God ruled Israel. Now the temple, Jesus and his spirit-filled followers, is the place from which and through which God is beginning to implement the world-transforming kingdom that was achieved in and through Jesus. Now, you can tell I got this from a theology book because of all those prepositions, right? In and by and through and from which and through which, and then it's just, it's, okay, just get to the point. Jesus and his spirit-filled followers is the place where God is transforming the world from. It's all about Jesus and his followers. Okay, so hang on to that for a second. Number two, heaven is the place from which the world is run. Think of it as the CEO's office. Well, that's kind of weird. Don't compare God to a CEO of a company. That's awfully secular of you. But what happens with a CEO? Well, a CEO is in charge. How do we typically see a CEO? Well, they're unattached. They don't really know the people. In this case, we've got a perfect CEO. Heaven is where God is enthroned and reigns supreme. And since we have a loving CEO, he comes to where the workers are. He sees the problems, fixes everything. It's as if the assembly line is broken down. The whole place is blown up in flames. The CEO goes and fixes it, recreates the whole factory, recreates the building where everyone's working, and says, all right, guys, I'm going to head back to my office, but you know how to reach me. You've got my phone number. My door's always open. I'm just going back to my office. Does he really leave the building? No, it's... I'm going back to where I rule from. We're familiar with thrones. We're familiar with that whole idea um, from Psalms and from uh, Matthew. All right, now get this. This is where it gets another layer deeper. I know this is really getting further and further into theology. We're going to come back up again. We will rise again out of all this, this theological stuff. But there is prophecy in Daniel 7. And so when we read in Acts about Jesus going up on a cloud, there is a fulfillment of Daniel 7. It says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and nations and peoples of every language and worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So for Jesus to go and rise up in the clouds, okay, that means we need to, re to fulfill the prophecy of Daniel 7. That makes sense, right? Gonna hang around there for a second. With prophecy, we know that everything that happens in the Gospels, there's some reason for it. There's a fulfillment, right? Next, Jesus has put the whole earth under new management. Again, we've got the CEO thing. Okay, this is where we start to surface again. The uh, NT writes says, anyone reading Luke's account, this is Jesus rising up on a cloud, at the beginning of Acts and already being familiar with the world of the early Roman Empire would realize what is happening. After the death of Julius Caesar, Caesar people swore they had seen his soul ascending to heaven. Augustus, who is Caesar's adopted son, promptly declared that Julius was therefore a god, which meant that he, Augustus, was now son of God. So, was Luke saying Jesus rose up on a cloud? Possibly. Or was he trying to use a reference that people were familiar with right here from culture? Augustus promptly declared that Julius was therefore a god because he had risen up, which meant Augustus was now son of God. So there is this history of someone rising and being the son of God. So it is possible that Luke is using a tool, a metaphor, to explain how important Jesus was. Here's another way to look at it. Readers in the Roman world realize what's going on. Jesus is radically upstaging Caesar. Think of this as a power shift. Paul is in Rome under Caesar's nose, announcing God as king and Jesus as Lord with all the boldness and no one stopping him. 
The whole book is the story of how Jesus, exercising his power as the CEO of earth and heaven, sends out his followers as ambassadors to make his kingdom a reality. I feel like I just jumped all over the place, so let's tie this together, okay? Number one, heaven and earth not being far apart. We got that, right? We've got Jesus coming and being the intersection point. Heaven is the place from which the world is run. There's a power shift happening here. When Jesus comes to save the world, that means whoever else is in charge and they see themselves as gods, that's going away. Storm is starting to build, right? Fulfillment of prophecy. This was all going to happen for a long time. And now, the world is under new management. Well, that's bad news for the people who think that they're running it already. They didn't get that memo because they weren't listening for that memo. So all of this about the ascension, maybe Jesus really did rise in bodily form, maybe he didn't. The point is that the whole world is now under different rulership. When you read Luke, when you read Acts, it's about this entire world where we live not being an earthly, striving, yucky mess of sin, but rather a whole new place that is now under new leadership. So we know that Jesus didn't go anywhere. Instead, he rebooted the government, took away what was there and said, I'm in charge now. He recreated the world. He didn't just fix what was broken. He said, look, what's here isn't working. I'm going to give you a new kingdom, a new testament, a new covenant. He started the kingdom here on earth. So this is where I'm trying to come full circle around. If we think that we're just stuck here, waiting for the kingdom to come later on, we're missing the whole point of what Jesus did. He started the kingdom 2,000 years ago, and we're now in it. Jesus didn't go like, I'll see you, sorry you're stuck here, I'll come back and we'll finish the work later on. It was, I'm headed back to my office, you guys are helping me run the place, we're going to do this together, and then I'm always here for you. So the kingdom began when the whole power shift happened, and now we're actually living in the kingdom. The kingdom, or eternal life as John puts it, um, you see it different ways in the Gospels, is under construction by the CEO's family, you and me. So we work in the family business. Now we might say, wait a minute, this doesn't look like the kingdom to me. Well, in the same way that Jesus overthrew the government, not by violence, but by being the recipient of sin and by laying down his life, we're doing the same thing. We're bringing about the whole world via peace via love, via the way Jesus lived his life. And now, whereas we saw heaven and earth and then the temple joining them together, Jesus recreated it and adopted all of humanity so that it's all together now. Now we don't have these two realms touching each other at the temple space. We have Jesus becoming the temple and reconciling all unto himself so that now we live in Jesus' space. Now we live in that other reality. And again, it's like, well, this world seems pretty messed up. It doesn't seem quite redeemed. Are you saying he's not coming back later? No, I'm just saying it started already. It's going to be completely finished, but you and I are part of the construction phase. So what does that mean? Blessings on the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours, Matthew 5, 3. And if you remember... Um, Remember Sting and the police from the 80s? Sting paraphrased the Beatitudes in a way that was really belligerent, but it stuck in my head. He said, they say the meek shall inherit the earth. And Sting said, but what good is a used up world and what good is it? How can it be worth having? Well, this is interesting. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours. It doesn't mean you will go to heaven when you die. And it doesn't mean, congratulations, the earth will be gift-wrapped for you. 
It means you will be one of those through whom God's kingdom, heaven's rule, begins to appear on earth as in heaven. When we pray, your kingdom come on earth as in, or your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's not just a future date. It's here on earth in the present what was already started. The Beatitudes are the agenda for kingdom's people. They're not simply about how to behave so that God will do something nice to you. This is part of the manual for being part of the family business. They are about the way in which Jesus wants to rule the world. He wants to do it through this sort of people, people actually just like himself. The Sermon on the Mount is a call to Jesus' followers to take up their vocation as light to the world, as salt to the earth. In other words, as people through whom Jesus' kingdom vision is to become a reality. Well, why do we dive through all of that extra stuff? Well, I want to show how ancient Israel saw the world, show how God completely upset the order of everything, how he rebooted leadership across our known universe and came and instituted a kingdom that's here. So to get back to our original question, aren't we just kind of waiting around till he comes back? No, he said, everything has begun and I'm inviting you to participate with me in this whole new world order. Okay, great. Well, so he says something about the good news. He says, uh, tell people the gospel, the good news. Well, well, what does that mean? Well, it means we're saved. Well, okay, hang on. What, 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 why do we need to be saved again? And, and to give you behind the scenes information you didn't ask for, I probably spent three hours just looking up salvation and then realized that's just a tangent. That's not the point to what we're talking about here. I think when I use the word saved, you know what I mean. We're not talking about people need to be rescued from eternal fiery torment. We're talking about why do people need to be saved again? Because humans are basically dead in our sin and miserable without Jesus. Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anyone who's miserable because of this the sin sickness? It's not about, I need to rescue you from hellfire. What about right now? Do you know anybody who's basically living in their own hell because they have this sin sickness? Or anyone who's lost or in a fog, tossed around by different ideas? Sometimes I'm so tired of listening to the news and reading advice columns and all of the blogs and, and, and different ideas. Of, Here's how to live, or what if we did this instead, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, unless you have Jesus grounding you, there's a million new ideas every day. And by the way, when I say new, I mean they've already been around a hundred times before. Why do we need to be saved? Because we're living a lie that we are not loved and accepted. Barbara told me that yesterday she was in a store shopping for clothes or something, and there were, she said something to a lady and said something like, I like that blouse. That lady kept talking to her for pretty much the rest of the time she was shopping. <laughs> People need to relate to someone, to feel listened to, to feel loved, to have attachment, to know that there's somebody out there who gives a rip about their existence. Do you know anybody like that? Some people who like to talk a lot don't feel listened to. And the irony is that you may not want to listen because you might think, oh, my neighbor's always talking. It's all I can do to get inside the house. Well, guess what? Maybe they really don't feel appreciated. And you could probably listen to them for the rest of your earthly life, and they still wouldn't necessarily feel that kind of appreciation. But if you introduce them to Jesus, Jesus doesn't get tired of listening to that person. And that person, Jesus, is the only one who can fulfill that need. We suffer from a fatal disease with symptoms leading to painful, destructive consequences. What lots of missionaries do and what lots of street preachers and lots of um, downtown ministries do is minister to people whose lives are just wrecked. Why do they do that? Well, part of it is that's what we do as kingdom people. We are the, the meek, we are the, the harmless, we are the ones who love on other people. But those people are also receptive to the truth. When you've got nothing else, Jesus sure looks good because he will still accept you. 
and you've got all these destructive consequences, all of the stuff that we keep doing in life. I keep getting myself into debt. I keep dating the wrong people. I keep having children with people who run away. I, I end up with a whole family of, of kids and they have five different fathers and I've got all this stuff. And it's like, we mess up our lives. And Jesus says, I'm not condemning you. I'm here to receive you and love you. Let's work together to get you out of these patterns. Let's get you out of these destructive consequences and live a life where you feel loved and get back on track. And most of all, we need to know why we were born in the first place. If someone walked up to you in a restaurant and said, why are we here? You might say, because I was hungry. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, why, are we, why were we born? Well, hopefully, as Christians, we understand the answer to that. We were meant to be loved. Why does anyone have a child? They want to love another being. We were born, we were created, we were meant to be loved. If we understand God wanted a family and wanted each one of us and planned for each one of us and loves each of us, that goes a whole lot further than you need to be saved, you need to believe in Jesus so you escape hellfire. If instead we say that there is a God who loves you more than I could possibly explain, that makes all the difference of the world and that explains why we were born in the first place. So we are not stuck here in limbo on a dead planet. If you talk to anyone who has been in church for a while, you'll probably come across this idea. It's like, well, I'm tired, I'm ready to go home. I get that. I feel like that some days too. <laughs> and sometimes I watch movies where the action star has such a will to live, I don't even understand. It's like, dude, by the time the second guy almost ran me over, I would have said, just do it, because I'd like to go home. <laughs> Not because I'm done with this life, but I don't fear going home. Going home is great, but we still have a life here that is worthwhile. Jesus didn't say, I'm going home, I'll see you in a few thousand years. He said, I started up a family business and I have a place for you to work here too. I'm sharing this with you. We're not stuck here in limbo on a dead, dilapidated, broken down, ugly mess of a disastrously abandoned planet, not at all. It is a planet that is being redeemed, has been redeemed, it has a kingdom already in start. It's already here. We see a church that continues to grow. We see the word of Jesus continuing to be expounded to people who need to hear it. We're workers in the kingdom that has already begun. So when we say, Lord, your kingdom come, Guess what? I saw a movie recently where there was an accident on the highway and there were two people in a car and one of them who's driving says, well, someone will come by and take care of it. And the other person said, somebody already has come by. That's the role that we're in now. Jesus already has come. It's not a matter of, I can't wait for the end. It's a matter of, guess what? You're here now. This is part of what we get to participate in. So the question is, will we participate? Or are we going to say, I'm just going to wait for the next guy to drive by and help that person. It looks like they're, you know, they're in trouble, but I really got a meeting I got to get to. <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm on a deadline here. Someone else will come by. Someone else will call 911 and, and, and brush it off to the police. No, will we participate in the world that Jesus has created for us? You pray with me. Father, we need your guidance. We need your help in understanding what it means to participate in a kingdom that you have already created. It's the kingdom of the, the here, and yet it's the kingdom of the not yet. But the here is so much bigger than perhaps we've ever realized. Father, help us to understand and participate in what you're doing in the world. Father, where there's need, help us to fill it. Where there's thirst, help us to assuage it. Where there's hunger, help us to feed. And all of it eventually, ultimately comes back to you.
because you're the only food, the only drink, the only one who can satisfy. Father, show us how to be your ambassadors. Show us how to be the light in your kingdom that's already here. Father, help us to be your faithful workers whom you love more than we understand. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.